Good evening and welcome to tonight's PACIT webinar. Tonight we're going to be covering material from the CompTIA A plus exam 220-801 and we will be covering objectives 1.6 and 1.7. I'm Brian Farrell, I'm your host this evening and I am the instructor for the TNI course and so let's go ahead and begin tonight's webinar. So what are objectives 1.6 and 1.7 of the 220-801 exam? Well, objective 1.6 is the central processing unit and objective 1.7 is common interface connections. And tonight we're going to begin with CPU basics. So let's start with Moore's law. Moore's law states that every two year, that every two years, approximately every two years, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit would double, leading to an exponential growth in the power of the integrated circuit, otherwise known as the CPU. In different words, Moore's law states that the power and capabilities of the CPU would double every two years. Now this has proven to be true for the most part, but not necessarily because of the number of transistors being put into the CPU. Part of this exponential growth has stemmed from improved instruction sets in other processes like putting multiple cores on into the CPU. But the end result has essentially remained the same. The power of the CPU has been doubling and will probably continue to double for at least a couple of more years. A lot of people have talked about how Moore's Law is actually beginning to fail, but it hasn't failed yet. And by the way, he stated that, uh, he made that statement about the, the power of the integrated circuit back in the early 1960s, and it's held true since then. It's actually kind of an amazing thing. So now let's move on here. Let's talk about the CPU. So what is it? Well, it is the electronic circuitry that carries out the instructions of a computer program. It operates using base, basic mathematics and utilizes the binary numbering system, zeros and ones, on or off. That's all the CPU does. It does everything through the use of binary mathematics. In modern computing, the CPU is a field replaceable component, meaning that it can be fairly easily replaced in case of failure. It is a grouping of transistors, resistors, and capacitors that are bonded and wired into a single chip, which is called the die. The speed of a CPU is measured is a measure of the frequency at which it operates, and it's currently measured in gigahertz, which are thousands of cycles per second. Actually, a gigahertz is a thousand cycles per second. Uh, the faster the processor is, the more work that it that can be done by the CPU. All CPUs have at least one core located on the die. The core is what does the heavy lifting. It is the actual processing unit of the CPU. Now, a multi-core CPU is when there are multiple cores put onto a single die. Okay, so you have essentially multiple CPUs on a single CPU. This is used to improve the performance of the CPU as each core can handle individual portions of a workload. They can each take a chunk of a single task or multiple tasks can be thrown at the multi-core CPU and it will handle the tasks uh, separately between the cores. 
Uh, then we have hyperthreading. Hyperthreading is when a physical CPU core is divided up logically into two virtual cores. Uh, it is used to improve the performance of the CPU. That's one of the ways that they've increased the, the capacity of the CPU. It is even possible to have a multi-core CPU that also includes hyperthreading, which would mean that a two-core CPU use, utilizing hyperthreading would appear like and function like a four-core CPU. Now, all CPUs also include some form of super fast random access memory called cache. It's, it's actually a form of static random access memory. Uh, cache is categorized by its location on the die. Uh, level one cache is actually built into the CPU's core. And it's super fast, but we do not use very much of it. Level 2 cache is situated just off the core, but still pretty close to the cores. And level 3 cache is actually the farthest away from the, from the CPU, or excuse me, from the cores. It's still on the die, and it's slower. And out of all the cache memory, it's what we use the most. That's what we have the most of on the die. And level 3 cache is shared between all of the cores. Now, some CPUs uh, come with virtualization support. That means that these CPUs will support virtual machines within, without the need of having a host operating system. They ease the process and maintenance of running virtual machines. Nowadays, some CPUs are coming with built-in graphics processing units, GPUs, as their own discrete unit on the die. The GPU can be used to replace add-on video graphics cards. In the past, built-in video support was not seen as being beneficial for the end user because it actually put a workload onto the CPU. But Today, with the GPU being on the same die as the CPU, built-in graphics aren't quite as bad. Now, all CPUs have a basic architecture, uh, and that architecture is that it's either 32-bit or 64-bits in nature. Uh, this architecture is fairly complex to describe, but basically it involves how many bits can be addressed at once, particularly in, in memory, RAM. And the main effect is that the architecture will affect how much RAM can actually be in a PC. A 32-bit CPU can only address a maximum of 4 gigabytes of RAM, while a 64-bit CPU can address 16.8 million terabytes of RAM. And yes, I did say 16.8 million terabytes. That's a tremendous amount of RAM. In practice, in the real world, the maximum amount of RAM that a 64-bit CPU can address is only limited by what the motherboard can handle. So if you have a motherboard that will, can only handle 32 gigabytes of RAM, guess what? You'll only be able to address 32 gigabytes of RAM. Or 16 or 64, but it's going to be dependent upon the motherboard. So let's talk about heating and cooling. So as a rule, the higher the performance of the CPU, the more heat it will generate. And excessive heat will kill or burn out a CPU. So we've got to figure out how to get rid of that heat. The first way that we get rid of it is through heat sinks, which is a device that is placed on top of the CPU. It usually has a solid metal base. Uh, either will, It will either be made from steel or copper, or it will have a copper insert in, inside of a steel base whichever method it uses, but it 
as a general rule, it has a solid base that transitions to fins at the top. The heat sink will draw the heat away from the surface of the CPU towards the top of the sink where it is radi radiated away into the case. Now to improve the performance of a heat sink, we use thermal paste. Now thermal paste is a special compound that is used between the heat sink and the CPU and it fills the microscopic voids that are present due to the manufacturing process. It creates a better connection between the, the bottom of the heat sink and the top of the CPU. It makes the heat sink more efficient. We often use fans to help radiate the heat away from the heat sink. As you can tell from that image there, this, this heat sink does have a fan on top of it. In certain situations, we utilize uh, liquid pulling, particularly if you're a gamer or if you're really running your system hard, you might want to consider liquid cooling. And this works like a radiator. The heat sink actually has liquid being pumped through it and it gets pumped through the heat sink, drawing the heat up away from the CPU and that liquid is pumped out to a radiator where the heat is radiated or dissipated away. So now that we have those basic CPU characteristics out of the way, let's talk about some CPUs. And we're going to start with Intel. So in currently, Intel uses the LAN grid array, an LGA, Actually, currently Intel manufactures LAN grid array CPUs, LGA CPUs. The CPU does not have any pins on the bottom of it. The pins are actually located in the CPU socket on the motherboard. And the CPUs have corresponding contacts, those little bumps that you see there in the image that match up to the pins that are in the socket. Intel processors are usually defined by their processor family, like Haswell or IV Trail, and the socket type. And actually, more often than not, you'll see them identified by socket type. Current socket types that you should know about are the LGA-775, the LGA-1155, the LGA-1156, and the LGA-1366. I do believe there's also an LGA-2066, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole lot more of them, and more are coming out all the time. By the way, the number there, like the LGA-775, what that really means is that that's a LAN grid array CPU and it has 775 contact points or there are 775 pins in the socket. So now let's move on to AMD CPUs. Most CPUs that AMD manufactures are pin grid array, PGA CPUs. That means that the CPU actually has the pins on the bottom of the CPU and that those pins fill corresponding holes in the motherboard CPU socket. Now AMD's naming convention is also based on processor family and, and socket type as well. More often than not, you'll see them referred to by the socket type. Some socket types that you need to know about are the 940, the AM2, the AM2+, plus, the AM3, the AM3+, plus, the FM1, and the F. And as with Intel, this is not a complete listing. Now, something that you more than likely won't be tested on, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. The And I'm going to pick on the AM2 family of sockets, uh, the AM2 Plus is actually compatible, backwards compatible with the AM2 
uh, socket. So you could put a processor that was an AM2 style processor, you could install it on an AM2 Plus socket and it would work just fine. Uh, Intel doesn't do that, only AMD does that. So how do you pick the right CPU? How do you find out which CPU is the right one for you? Well, the key is to determining the correct CPU is to do your research. Uh, when researching the purchase of a CPU, you need to consider what you are trying to achieve and what your budgetary constraints are. As a rule, the better the performance of the CPU, the more money it, it will cost. The newer the processor the family it comes from, the more money it will cost. Uh, another thing to remember is that in most situations, the software that is available today cannot take advantage of the full capabilities of the CPU, but it may in the future. So uh, you might want to shy away from the cutting edge CPUs because they tend to cost more money. I tend to run mine about a generation behind uh, what's currently being offered. I have found that to be the uh, sweet spot for me. But then again, that's me, and I don't tax my CPUs all that hard very much. Well, that about covers it for the objective 1.6. Uh, good evening, Eric. Welcome for welcome to the webinar this evening. I'm Brian Farrell, your host and guest this evening, as well as being the instructor for the course. If you have any questions during the webinar, go ahead and pipe up. Give them to me as long as they're about the material. By the way, we are being recorded. And I do tend to speak rather fast, by the way, if, if you haven't noticed. Um, after the end of the after the end of the webinar, I will shut down the recording if there are no questions on the material, and I will answer any and all questions that you have to throw at me. So now let's move on to objective 1.7. The objective 1.7 has to deal with common inter interface connections. And we're going to begin inside the computer case. And where do we start inside the case? We start with the IDE interface, the Integrated Drive Electronics. Now, IDE used a 40-pin, 40 40-wire 40 ribbon cable that could be up to 18 inches long, and it could have up to three connections on it. You are guaranteed to have at least two. Uh, when it had for peripheral devices, which could be hard drives, uh, CD-ROMs, DVD-ROMs, so on and so forth. The connectors are keyed so that they can only be inserted one way. Now, IDE had a maximum or has a maximum transfer rate of 8.3 megabytes per second. Oh, by the way, we're going to go here, and I need to let you know that you should be able to identify the difference between an IDE and an EIDE uh, cable and it's mainly by how many wires are in the cable. Actually, it's all by how many wires are in the cable. Talking about EIDE, here we go. By the way, if you look at where the circle is, that is an IDE-EIDE interface where the cable plugs into on the motherboard. Now, the EIDE, the Enhanced Integrated Drive Electronics, interface uses a 40 pin 40 wire ribbon cable and it has the same physical dimensions in the layout as an IDE cable. You can you can plug an EIDE cable into a IDE device and it'll function just fine. You won't get the transfer rates, but hey, not, nothing works perfectly now, does it? Now, EIDE had a maximum transfer rate of 167 megabytes per second. 
And excuse me while I put my dog away. Apparently, I don't have to do that. Um, and both IDE and EIDE are associated with the Parallel Advanced Technology Attachment Devices, PADA devices. Moving on, now we get to talk about serial AT attachment or serial advanced technology attachment, SATA. Now, SATA is the high-speed interface that is the replacement for IDE, EIDE. And for the data cable, it uses a seven-wire, seven-pin cable that is L-shaped, that has an L-shaped connector on it, which means that it's keyed. It can only be inserted one way, and your cable length can be up to one meter in length. Now, unlike IDE, the IDE interface, only one SATA device is allowed per cable. Your priority for devices, the SATA is established in the system BIOS. It's no longer set by jumpers. And an interesting side note, all SATA devices are hot swappable. That means that you don't need to shut down the PC before you unplug a SATA device and plug a new one in. But since we're talking about inside the case at the moment, I'm not sure how much good that's going to do you. Now, there are three main standards for SATA, SATA 1, SATA 2, and SATA 3. SATA 1 had a maximum transfer rate of 1.5 gigabits per second. That's 150 megabytes per second. SATA 2 could transfer up to 3 gigabits per second, or 300 megabytes per, sec per second, depending upon how you want to do it. And SATA 3 has a theoretical transfer rate of 6 gigabits per second, or 600 megabytes per second. It's theoretical in nature because I don't think they've made a device yet that can actually shove that much data down the cable. Uh, at least not commercially. Uh, now we're going to move outside the case for just a moment, and we're going to talk about eSATA. eSATA is, stands for external SATA, and that's bringing the high-speed SATA interface to outside the computer case. Now eSATA allows for up to a two meter long cable, and it can perform at SATA three levels with external drives that support it. Now here's, a, here's an item that isn't in the CompTIA material, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. The eSATA interface on the outside of your computer, if you look at it, is a combo port. eSATA in, is combined with USB. Uh, works well, safe space, so on and so forth. The only problem is, is that the organization that sets the standard for USB has not approved the eSATA port. On top of that, the organization that's responsible for establishing the criteria for SATA, for the standards for SATA, well, they haven't approved the port. So the eSATA port is, it, it works, but it is an unapproved port. Just, just so you know that. Uh, okay, now continuing on. Brian, yeah. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, on eSATA, um, I could see where the hot swappability uh, would be more appropriate for external uh, SATA. Um, instead of trying to do it, you know, on the inside, say that. And then um, my yep. laptop, which is so two or three years old, it's got one of those combo SATA USB uh, ports in it. So yep. um, I guess other laptops may have that too, uh, the safe space. So just yep. add to that. 
a lot of them, a lot of them do. The laptop I use does. Um, and if you have that eSATA, that eSATA port, it essentially works at the SATA 3 speeds, which is faster than USB. So if you need the speed and you need the power, go for it. Um, eSATA devices are not that much more expensive than a USB 2 device. Uh, they work okay. It's just that the port has not been approved by the two organizations that should be setting the standards. One other thing I've noticed, there are so there aren't as many ECDA external drives. Um, it, it almost seems like ECDA hasn't really picked up um, as much as the standard no, USB. No, it, it has not gained as much popularity as you would think, um, and part of that has to deal with uh, the advent of USB 3.0. Um, which still doesn't still doesn't offer the performance of SATA 3, but since there isn't a commercial is not a commercial device that can take full advantage of SATA 3, uh, the USB 3.0 works just as well, if not better, and offers more backwards compatibility. And one other thing, you say that speaking of I'm sorry, go ahead. Nope, nope, go, go, I was just go for say, it. Also, eSATA uses, I think, a different cable than SATA. Yes, it does. You, you cannot use your internal SATA cable on the outside. It has slightly different um, wiring, and that may be why it hasn't, why that port has not been approved. I don't know that for a fact. I just know that um, it has not been approved. So now let's talk about USB, or I'm going to run through information on USB depending upon how this goes. USB was first introduced in 1998, and it is the universal serial bus. Now, the standard allows for the ability to chain multiple devices together. You can chain up to 127 devices plus the controller, which actually gives you a grand total of 128 devices. Uh, but the way the material puts it down, that's 127 devices plus the controller. The interface not only provides a data bus, but if you're using a USB-A type port, you can also provide power to run small devices. USB 1.1 and USB 2.0 have a maximum cable length of 5 meters. Uh, USB 3.0 does not have a maximum cable length. Their only stipulation on cable length for 3.0 is it has to meet the electrical specifications that USB 3.0 requires. They don't care how long it is. Now, USB 1.1 was, was fairly fast at the time. It could provide transfer rates of up to 12 megabits per second. Um, USB 2.0 could achieve maximum transfer rates of 480 megabits per second. Hey, Craig, your mic's on. Um, USB 3.0 has a theoretical maximum transfer rate of 5 gigabits per second or 500 megabytes per second. It leaps and bounds faster than USB 2.0. Now, it does use a different cable, a different style of cable, but the USB 
3.0 port on the PC or a laptop is backwards compatible with USB 2.0 and 1.1. Now, the USB standard does call for different types of physical connectors. There's the type A, and that's the top one on that list there. And that is the one that most of us are familiar with, and that is the one that supplies power to small devices if they require it. Then there's the type B, which you will find on a lot of USB cables that connect to things like printers. And then there are the Mini A and the Mini B. But it does call for different connectors. Now, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to give you some outdated information. But it's information that, uh, last time I looked, is what CompTIA calls relevant. Sorry about that. I'm just giving you a heads up and before I do it. Uh, let's talk about the IEEE 1394 standard. That's FireWire. Uh, it was developed by Apple and introduced in 1999. It has since been taken over by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, and they've standardized it as the, their IEEE 1394 standard. It allows for up to 16 devices to be chained together. Uh, the maximum allowable cable length is 4.5 meters. And the various standards are kind of backwards compatible, but not really because they use different cables. Now, FireWire 400 has a maximum transfer rate of 400 megabits per second. FireWire 800 has a maximum transfer rate of 800 megabits per second. And as far as CompTIA is concerned, that's all you really need to know about FireWire. I do know that there are faster um, versions of FireWire out there. But like I said, CompTIA only calls that the relevant information that you need to know. So now let's talk about some other common interfaces. You need to know about serial and parallel. I call these the legacy standard for peripheral devices. I don't know about the rest of you, but I do know that Craig will remember this, that the serial port and the parallel port were the main ways that you connected to peripheral devices in the very first PCs. Now, most PCs no longer come equipped with these interface connections. Uh, replacing them with the more versatile USB interface instead. Now, the serial I port, those on, which I don't show right here. On uh, like 90, Windows yeah. 95 to XP era, for sure. Everything had those. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're showing your age, Eric. <laughs> Anyhow, continue. Yep. Yep. The, the serial port... Um, used a D sub miniature nine pin connection called a DB9. Uh, D because it was shaped like a D. B because it's actually a B shell connector, by the way. And nine because it had nine pins. Serial communication means that it goes out one bit at a time, by the way. And your parallel, your standard parallel connection connection was a D sub miniature 25 pin, a DB25, and it offered parallel communication. Imagine that. Now, parallel communication is different than serial communication. Parallel communication it puts blocks of blocks of bits on the wire at a time. It doesn't send them one at a time, one bit at a time. It sends blocks of data, blocks of data at a time. Now I need to take a breath for just a second. Now let's move on to interface standards for connecting to monitors. And we start with the VGA, which is also called a DB, a DB 
uh, 15, and you can call it an HD15 as well. All are the same thing as the VGA connector. It used a D sub-miniature high-density 15-pin connector, and it and it took your digital information from inside the PC and converted it to an analog signal and sent it to your monitor, more than likely your CRT. Um, it was it was or is in the process of being replaced by the DVI, the digital video the digital video interface. Now, DVI interface comes in several different versions. It comes in DVI-A, it comes in DVI-D, and it comes in DVI-I. DVI-A stands for Digital Video Interface Analog, and it will only transfer an analog signal to the monitor. DVI-D, uh, it will transfer transfer digital only to the monitor. And DVI-I, Digital Video Interface Integrated, has the capability of transferring both analog or digital information to the monitor. There is also the HDMI, the High Definition Media Interface. Now this takes your, dig, your digital image plus sound and transfers them uncompressed down the same cable to whatever device you're outputting to. So you can carry both image and sound on the same cable. Uh, as far as this exam objective, we don't get into display port, but there are also display ports. Let's talk about the interface standards for twisted pair wires, the RJ45 and the RJ11. Your RJ45, your registered Jack 45, is technically really a modular 8 pin, 8 conductor connector. That's just a whole lot harder to say than RJ45. And what that means is it has eight pins in the in the connector, and it can take up to eight wires in there. That is the interface that everybody is pretty much familiar with, especially if you've done any Ethernet networking, because that is the standard plug for that. The other one is the RJ11, the registered Jack 11. That is, in actuality, a modular six-pin four-conductor connector. Like some, that could be a tongue twister. Which means that it has space in the in the plug for six wires, but only four of those spaces actually have connections to them, pins to them. That's your telephone wire, telephone telephone plug, and it is used with plain old telephone service pots. Uh, we don't use that very much, but in the old days when you had a modem, a true modem, you got pretty well used to those. So now we're going to move on to the category of Brian? other interface connections. Yes, sir. Um, on the RJ11, though, you still have to use have a connection if you're doing home DSL, because that still is using the telephone jack. So you still have an RJ11. You have a need for that because that gets connected into the router. Correct. So there is there's still being used. But most people are getting rid of their regular telephones. But for DSL, that still requires yep. the, the RJ11 because you're still connecting to the old telephone jacks. Just, just, but instead, it, it's a different purpose. It connects to the to, to the router, and then from the router, then you're connecting your RJ45 uh, using your RJ45 cable. Correct. That's your wireless router. But 
but more than but more than likely you're not going to find an RJ11 interface on your PC. That's yeah, that's correct. Not for me, that's correct. Yep. Um, but we but we still use RJ11s almost every every day, especially if you still have a landline. So now let's move on to other interface connections. First up is infrared. Uh, it's a line of sight only, so your devices must be within visual range. Uh, it uses the infrared band of light to communicate between devices, and it has a distance limitation of approximately three feet. Uh, if you're talking about uh, between computing devices. Most of your remote controls still use uh, infrared, still use IR to communicate, but we're not talking about your television, we're talking about computers. Uh, they're not, an IR infrared networking is not that common anymore, it used to be the way of the world, particularly if you had a Palm Pilot. Anybody remember those? For sure. Yeah, I was just looking for some clarification on like examples of what might use it. So thanks. Yep. yep. Um, they actually made some printers that were infra infrared connected printers. They weren't that common. Uh, those particular printers were used for connecting to like digital cameras most of the time. Uh, some of the early, earlier cell phone technology, you could transfer data between cell phones using infrared. Greg, you were you going to help out? Oh, I thought you were going going to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I pressed the wrong button. Um, yeah, old laptops. Okay. Yeah, infrared. Uh, Old lap, oh yeah, old lap laptops, old laptop computers. Yep. And it it just wasn't that common. The limitations were too great, and it was uh, touchy, touchy to deal with, at least to get it to work correctly. And no security. <laughs> yeah, no security. But then again, back then, we really didn't care about security. We didn't know any better. Um, and for the most part, infrared was replaced by radio frequency. Now, RF networking or the RF interface actually encompasses a whole bunch of different standards. Um, but they all involve the same thing, which is communicating via radio waves. Most of those standards are covered by the IEEE standard 802.11, but not all of them are. Your distance is only limited by the power of the transmitting device, which is actually limited by the standards, uh, which you could soup up uh, a wireless access point, you could overpower it and increase your distance if you really wanted to. The other limitation is speed, and that is limited by the standards that you employ. They're getting really, really fast. If you haven't looked them up, you might want to look up some of the specifications on 802.11ac and that's not even the fastest standards out there yet. The rest of them just haven't hit the market. Brian? Uh, they will. Uh, radio frequency? Yes, sir. Is that why, that's Wi-Fi. Correct? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, when, you, when you actually mention Wi-Fi, uh, we think of we think of 
of Wi-Fi as being wireless networking, which is radio frequency networking. But when you actually say Wi-Fi, you are making a reference to the Wi-Fi uh, alliance. By the way, Wi-Fi originally came out of wireless fidelity, but you're actually talking about or making a reference to the Wi-Fi alliance, which is the organization that certifies wireless equipment. They will certify a wireless access point as being 802.11n capable. The general public, if you said Wi-Fi, would think wireless networking and radio frequency networking. And, and yes, that's true, but technically Wi-Fi is the standards organization and not the actual item. Did I clear that up? Yes, I did that purposely because you answered that before in the email. I wanted you to bring that up. <laughs> I, I think... I figured that's probably why you asked asked the question. Um, but most most people do just say Wi-Fi yeah. when they mean wireless networking. Yeah. I'm guilty of it. Most everybody that I know is guilty of it. So it's the way of the world. It's kind of like Kleenex. Kleenex was originally a brand, and now it's an item. Same same thing with aspirin, by the way. So now we're going to move on to Bluetooth. Now Bluetooth is a low-powered personal area network, a PAN. Uh, Bluetooth is actually a PAN standard for creating a radio frequency connection. It's on the 2.4 gigahertz radio frequency and has an effective range of 10 meters for a class 2, I think, device. Uh, but it has an effective range of 10 meters. But the farther away you get between the transmitter and the receiver, the transfer rate starts to drop off fairly rapidly. And that's what you need to know for that. Uh, um, quick question. Uh, so all those, yes, all those personal yep. drones that are coming out, what um, what frequency yep. do they run off of? Is it Bluetooth that, that and they just have a stronger connection, or what's that? What what do they use? Nope, nope. They are using um, they're using private band radio frequencies. Hmm. To transmit their data. So each each uh, um, uh, individual one would have a unique signature that talks to a device or app or program. Hopefully, huh. hopefully, they each do that. Each one has each one has a crystal in it that's tuned to receive a very specific frequency, and so when they're when you're transmitting uh, the instructions to it, hopefully no other device around is receiving that same same signal. You can fine tune the frequencies enough to where that the possibility of that happening is is pretty minimal, but you also run the risk of having interference, uh, at least in the commercial market. You do. Hmm. Thanks. Not a problem. I do. I did notice that I forgot to put my thank you slide in, so I'm going to tell you thank you. I'm at the end of my material for this evening. On behalf of PACET and Edmonds Community College, I really appreciate the opportunities that this course gives, and I wish you all a good night. <laughs>